This may I please invite Advocate Dr. Prashant Mali, international cyber and privacy lawyer, policy thought leader, researcher, and published author. Let's welcome him, please. Good afternoon, everybody. There is a slight issue with the topic. The topic is, I my presentation is on the latest Data Privacy Act, and uh, there's some mismatch about topics. Like, and the topic here is about attack vectors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix both. And because ultimately attack vectors lead to data leakage or uh, cyber attacks will lead to data leakage. And because of non-compliance to data leakage and uh, non-compliance to uh, the act, you may get penalized. Okay, so I'm just mixing, marrying both of them. So when we're looking at attack vectors, now there are dozens and even hundreds of attack vectors which may present which may be present in your network and you are not aware of so if you look at current problems of attack vectors it could be vulnerable your, your vulnerable web components what what you have your um, expired certificates now you would say still does still expired certificates is a problem in the it world yes I have seen many big companies, including large government organizations, who have this problem of expired web cert uh, expired certificates and public dev sites. Now, this could be one of few of the vectors which could have problems with which you could have problems. But when you look at how do you mitigate this risk? How do you mitigate the various risk which uh, mm, you are uh, network faces, then how do you mitigate this? By assuming zero trust. Now, zero trust is not a new concept. You know, zero trust has remained a concept from ages, but assumed a name possibly when this, uh, uh, it was formally recognized as something which can be implemented in the InfoSec policy. Now, you could have strong access protocols to mitigate those risks. You can have strong authentication policies. You can protect your backups. Now, as a lawyer, many a times I get clients who have lost even their backups. Even the backup is affected by malware and money ransom is asked. Now, how much ransom gets asked and how much ransom gets settled, I can tell you by individual case laws, in fact, cases which I have handled. Now, it has gone, this handling ransomware and paying money has gone so much deep that organizations, CIOs, CISOs have started budgeting to pay ransoms. You know, that is a bad state of affairs. Why they have started budgeting to pay ransom? Because so much amount of ransom is constantly being asked. And if you ask me, what are the big companies? Just close your eyes and assume big banks. Close your eyes and assume big search engines okay and big fintech companies they are all they have all paid ransom and how much ransom you know how you, this attackers when they have an attack obviously with depth on in depth study for, just to mention i have handled the biggest highest in india of cosmos bank so imagine what went wrong was started with the router with the server they were uh, using the server was the unit was purchased from russia just to you know cost cutting l1 kind of thing and at that level uh, the money was exchanged i'll just share a case with you is the biggest one of the biggest stock broking app based stock broking company where you know ransom was asked to not to leak the data, and when money was asked, the hacker was present on Telegram channel. And I was talking to that hacker on Telegram channel. You know, I had to download Telegram and start talking to the hacker. And I was literally talking to him. Later, we went further, and we came to know that my the companies whom uh, the, who had uh, who were my client, the directors were U.S. citizens, and because the directors were U.S. citizens. And there is a law there, you know, you really can't pay ransom, your citizenship can come at issue. We stopped talking to this hacker or the hacker started chasing me. So I had to remove my telegram from my mobile phone and deactivate my account. 
Okay, so first he was chasing the target, then he was chasing the lawyer. Okay, so these things can happen and vectors happen. So in corporate world, uh, you know, only cybersecurity controls, because what happens when there is an attack, your image is at stake. So when image is at stake, there has to be incident management policy in your organization. Now that incident management policy could be written or unwritten. You should be, you are following what is written and you could be executing what is unwritten because you need to save your brand value when the attack happens. So you can segment your network, now whatever I'm saying, one, two, three, four, is an idealistic situation. But you, I, if CISOs are around, they know when there is a cyber attack, you can't follow an idealistic situation which is written in InfoSec policy. You have to devise on the go strategy along in coordination with your legal compliance, IT team, your board of directors, and execute this. Okay, so similarly, I want to take you to, if some data leaks happen, the new law has come in. And what is the new law? The new law is the Digital Personal Data Protection Act 2023. And this new act is applicable to various organizations. Don't ask me about whether it is applicable to FinTech, banking, insurance. It is applicable to each and everybody who is handling personal data, including government of India. So DPDP is applicable. Now this presentation I'm going to share. I've got 15 minutes. So I'll just rush through this presentation. I'm going to share with the organizers. So this is applicable, and I'm also going to put it on my LinkedIn post, so you can download it from there, there too. So any time there is a personal data being presented, when you're taking personal data from an individual, this will get applicable. Which data? Digital personal data. So what is the loophole? I'm giving you free legal advice. If you don't want DPDP to be applicable, when you take KYC documents, don't scan it. The moment you scan it, it becomes digital personal data. So you're converting physical data to digital data. If you don't scan it and you still go in the old age box file business, DPDP is not applicable. But how, do you, how will you implement? I really don't know. Because then you'll again need to have a lot of uh, libraries of box files. You know? So, any person, personal data has what? Any data about an individual who is identifiable by or in relation to such data. So this is the definition which has come in the Data Protection Act. DPDP is the Indian Data Protection Act, which is now an act, but not notified. Please note that it is not notified. It will take another six months to get notified as per the Honorable Minister. So everybody in this room, major of, major, majority of you must have been prepared for GDPR compliance. So people who have uh, complied with GDPR compliance, what could be the difference? What is the difference here is if you look at the applicability, all kinds of personal data is, you know, GDPR, when you comply with GDPR, everything, every personal data is applicable. But when you look at DPDP, only digital personal data is applicable. Then in 16, uh, about the age, 13 to 16 years, th this screen is gone. Uh, from 13 to 16 years is for uh, your, uh, no, below can be classified as children, but in uh, India it is 18 years, below 18 years, okay. Then uh, sensitive personal data has been covered under GDPR, which is not covered under DPDP. It is just because for personal data. Act. And what is, mo what more, uh, there are some kinds of principles in GDPR, but DPDP doesn't announce any principles. Now what is DPDP then? DPDP is a 30 section small, 30 section small law written in plain English, which each one of you can easily understand. But I want to put a caution here. You can understand the law, but interpretation, you should better leave it to the legal department or lawyers. Why? Because the penalty here is, for non-compliance, 250 CR. So CISO should decide whether you want to have that responsibilities, responsibility of 250 CR on you, because then the board will come after you. And it is not only 250 CR, 
if you are a significant data fiduciary, it can go up till 500 CR. How I'm going to go further in the presentation and let you know. So there are two types of fiduciary. One is normal fiduciary and other is significant data fiduciary. Significant data fiduciary requires to appoint DPO. Normal data fiduciary need not appoint DPO. So how much could, who all could be significant data fiduciary? People who have lot, large amount of data, people who are uh, you know, social media intermediaries, people like banks, financial companies, Amazon of the world, they all need, they will be declared as significant data fiduciary. So what is the status today? Nobody is declared yet. What is the status today? There is no data production board as of now declared. Possibly in one month of time, a data production board could be declared where all the punishment can be taken. Now before, because my time is up, I'm going to come to the most important point. See, do you and me, when we lose data, where do we go? So this is a normal FAQ which people ask. If, so you are called a data principal. You and me are called data principal. And if you lose data, you need to go to the DPO of the significant data fiduciary. If the significant data fiduciary doesn't resolve your problem, you go to the data protection board. And the penalty is up to 100 and 250 CR crores, which you will not get. Government of India will get. So data, aapka ja hai, you will lose the data and government of India will get the money. That is the equation in India's DPDP law. It is not GDPR that you will earn money. Okay, so paisa government ko milna hai. And it is per record. How much your records have been lost, it could be into 250 CR. That's what the Honorable Minister had to say. So that, kind, that amount of huge risk is there. There is one funny section, one funny section like, suppose you as a data principal, you are giving wrong data to data fiduciary, the person who's collecting data. Like about, you are lying about age, you are lying about your name. Many, many women lie about their age. So, or many women also lie about their names and they then want to change the name. In this case, if you are lying, then you may be charged rupees 10,000 rupees. Okay, you, data protection board can charge you 10,000 rupees for giving wrong data to data fiduciary. So instead of pro protect, because these are the duties given to us under the law. So you should be very careful. You should be very careful to implement consent management software. I can have a complete talk only on consent management, how it is done in the uh, Data Protection Act, because consent management is the most important thing which you should take, should, your takeaway should be here from the conference. You need to implement consent management. What are the different consents asked? To change the name. You know, in India, they add certain words to your names, certain alphabets to your names. You want to change that. DPDP, according to DPDP, you should provide them a interface where they are allowed to change the name, allowed to report the change of name, and different reportings can be done. So these would be really an extra cost. And if you don't do, then you can be considered as you know, in non-compliance with this. So what are the different grounds for uh, processing personal data? So when the data principle provides consent, when it does consent or for any legitimate use, what is legitimate use? Government can process data for legitimate use. Legally, it can be processed for legitimate use. For some public policies, it can be processed. Or other is lawful use. Uh, can be done. Each can be described separately and an explanation can be accorded to it. Important thing, when you want to take consent of the data principle, you need to send them notice. And you have to send them notice in almost 20 languages. All the languages mentioned in Schedule 8 of the Indian Constitution. So when you, because vernacular medium mein, the notice has to be give, given so you receive the consent because only English or Hindi is not acceptable in this and it is clearly written in the law in the 8th schedule. So these are penalties. Penalties starts from 250 CR for following reasonable security safeguards. 
Please note section 43 capital A of the IT Act which talks about reasonable security practices has been removed from the Information Technology Act. Normally CISOs ask me, is there any jail term for not following this law? And normal ye puste ki jail hoga kya? So under the DPDP Act, there is no jail term. Under the DPDP Act, police has no powers. But if you IT Act is still alive, if there is a data theft happening in your organization or data has been under theft, under unauthorized access, section 43B read with section 66 still applies. Punishment is up to three years of imprisonment and imprisonment and five lakhs of uh, fine. So that law still ap applies. So 250 CR, 200 CR, 200 CR, 150 CR. So for, just to give you one example, this requires a larger interpretation because uh, clients are asking me if you want to really take a cyber insurance, what should be the, what should be, what is the legal risk and for what amount you should you take the cyber insurance. Now this remains a gray area as of now when the data protection board will be formed based on certain rules, they will calculate the fine. It is extinct to 250 crores. This means 250 CR is not the penalty. It could be even 50 CR, even 20 CR. It depends upon what kind of data is leaked and what kind of company is leaking the data. So there will be a formula devised by Data Protection Board and then I think uh, uh, you will have a right perspective on this. If you see this first part, breach in observing duties under section 15. Now these are duties of the data principle. The, ext the fine may extend to 10,000 rupees. Now this could be 1,500, anything, or 10,000, depending on the Data Protection Board. So any breach apart from actual data protection will lead to punishment of 50 CR. So I think that is from my side for today. I am already exceeded it by six minutes. I can still take some couple of questions. Questions can be very small, huh? Yeah, any questions? Mike, Mike. Yeah, hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm Tushar Gupta and I'm a cyber insurance specialist that way. So my question from a legal standpoint is, a lot of CISOs ask us as well uh, that what should be the limit that they should buy. And one of the most interpretations, important interpretations that we are looking an answer for is, if DPDP levies a fine on an organization, in your opinion, does the cyber insurance policy take that or will it leave to the CISOs to take care of it? Oh, good. So this is a thought process going on, huh? Good, good. So CISOs must be already worried that you're not going to get any money after DPDP has been fined, when you're fined under DPDP. See, DPDP Act will fine you for five, six things. One is if the data is leaked. Second is if you, when you're not giving notice, that is negligence. So negligence is a part of cyber insurance. Okay, any insurance for that matter. Third is when there is actual data leakage due to some incident. Okay, so some part of DPDP will definitely be get covered under cyber insurance. Some part is still a gray area. Okay, for that you need to come in person for a legal opinion based on case to case because it will depend upon what kind of a business your client is taking. Okay, and what kind of data he is handling? What are the amount of risk, et cetera? Okay, but to answer you straight, some part can be insured, some part can still remain a gray area depending upon the client you're handling. So I will talk more if you have time, but thank you for the answer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, any more question? Good, thank you very much for listening to me, thank you.